Hello everyone, uh, this is Hikto Sri, the coordinator of PIX Today webinar series. I welcome you all on behalf of COEC PIX IIT Madras. My warm greetings to Mikhail Rakowski from Global Foundry USA. We are really fortunate to have him today. So before having his uh, interesting talk on monolithic silicon photonics foundry, I would like to request uh, Professor Vijay Krishna Das to introduce our honorable speaker. I'll also request uh, Professor Deepa Venkates to moderate our Q&A session at, at the end of the talk. So Professor Das, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Sri. And uh, you are most welcome, uh, Dr. Mikhail Rakowski. And uh, we are really delighted to host you and uh, really uh, grateful to you for agreeing uh, to give a webinar talk for us, for our audience, our own students. And uh, there are many uh, registered uh, uh, attendants are there across the world. So uh, I think uh, we have already uh, circulated your uh, bio data to everyone, but for completeness, uh, I want to uh, just read out once again. And uh, Dr. Rakowski is, a, uh, is a really expert in silicon photonics. And uh, he, uh, he did his PhD in electrical engineering from KU Leuven, Belgium. And uh, his work was for the development of uh, high speed and low power silicon photonics transceiver. So currently he is a senior technical staff, senior technical uh, staff member at uh, Global Foundries, working in Malta, New York. And uh, prior to that, actually uh, he has worked more than 10 years in CMOS uh, electronics and now uh, for about uh, ten, another 10 years in the area of silicon photonics, mostly micro ring resonator based uh, transceiver and uh, WGM systems, wavelength division multiplex systems. So overall, he has experience in fabrication for more than 25 years, uh, silicon photonics and CMOS electronic devices uh, together. And uh, he holds over a, a dozen of patents, international patents, and uh, author and uh, as a first author and co-author also more than 50 papers in the field of silicon integrated photonics. So 25 years of his experience and uh, uh, will be surely, uh, 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 will gain a lot of things. So his knowledge is, is we'll be going to see her uh, today. And uh, for you'll be talking about uh, 45 minutes to one hour. And I request all the audience, uh, you just put up your questions in the Q&A box. And uh, our moderator, Professor uh, Deepa Venkites, uh, she will try to handle at the end of the talk. And I'm sure that uh, Dr. Mikhail Rakowski will uh, answer them. And will uh, all the uh, panel members are there also. They will, be, they will have uh, some sort of interactions uh, if time permits. So all of the uh, entire talk will be recorded and we'll be putting uh, in the YouTube and uh, you can also rewind it again in future and uh, you can learn again. And right now you can directly interrupt. If you wish to also directly interrupt with him, you just send a message that we can just enable you. You can just directly put up questions to uh, Dr. Rakowski. With this introduction, I welcome again once again, uh, uh, Dr. Rakowski. So the stage is yours. Uh, please, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, this introduction and uh, actually having me here. It's a really uh, great pleasure to, to, to be here and, and uh, uh, give a talk. Um, I'm, not, I'm not the first one. So uh, in, this, in this discussion, and I see you got a, a lot of uh, excellent speakers with a lot of experience. So actually, I'm, I'm hoping I will be able to and uh, somehow contribute and and give give something more um, uh, to this uh, series of talks on on the silicon photonics, and um, especially especially from the um, kind of um, commercial foundry point of view, um, which enabling um, monolithic silicon photonics. So in this talk, I would like to um, kind of walk uh, through you 
um, how how we're working or um, enabling uh, silicon photonics, uh, especially and um, opening the path um, for the high speed uh, silicon photonic transceiver and how we can reach um, uh, terabit per second uh, transceiver per, per optical channel. Um, on the first slide, um, uh, some, some um, outline of the talk. Uh, I would like to start briefly with um, presenting uh, Global Foundry's um, work uh, on silicon photonics and um, offering uh, target market, etc. Uh, and next, I will I want to really deep dive um, into silicon photonic transceiver and talking about the different uh, scaling option integration scheme that we are actually considering uh, and trying to, uh, to 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 enable um, for for everybody. I'm discussing a little bit the key photonic uh, building blocks, uh, primary focusing um, on the on the optical IO, uh, which is actually one of the key components to to enable um, high efficient um, uh, transceiver, but also necessary necessary components, active active and passive devices. And and finally, um, as a kind of example, um, I would like to present you. Uh, wavelength division, uh, multiplexing, ring-based, and um, transceiver, and a little bit discuss um, um, challenges and and uh, how how we are meeting um, meeting uh, speed requirements in order to actually enable this path um, to and and beyond um, terabits per second. Um, so so first. Um, about the global foundry silicon photonics. Um, so what, what you see, what you see on the picture is a um, um, is a Malta site uh, in in upstate New York. It's like uh, 25, 35 kilometers um, north from um, uh, from from Albany, capital of the New York. Uh, it's actually the site is uh, really located in the. Um, Mm, beautiful area uh, in the in the middle kind of the woods with the with the nice lake at the background, and what we actually have it here developing um, really advanced technologies, uh, FinFETs, um, RF technology based on the 45 nanometer, and uh, over the last couple of years we also brought here um, silicon photonics. Uh, silicon photonic is not really new for the for the global foundries and as a, um, and. Uh, it was earlier developed um, in in, uh, in Fishkill that was uh, based on the 90 nanometers, and uh, also in in Burlington, uh, uh, even even further north from the uh, from from, uh, from from Malta, um, but but also in the Singapore in the Singapore lab. So silicon photonics uh, actually global have uh, some experience in in really working on the photonics, and now um, the, the the breakthrough is coming from the 45 uh, mon nanometer monolithic platform. So what do we actually uh, what do we actually build and how how what is our platform? Uh, so our second photonic is um, it's a monolithic integration of the electronics uh, CMOS based on the SOI wafer together with the uh, photonic uh, library. And the below you can see in a kind of sketch of the um, of the front end and middle of the line uh, where we have a, a, a electronic devices here just simply represented as an um, NFET and uh, Silicon Germany PFET, um, and uh, together integrated in the in the single process on the single wafer with the uh, silicon photonic devices. In order to do that, we use uh, dual uh, thickness, um, uh, dual thickness of the silicon. We have a full thickness um, of the silicon to to build the waveguides and uh, modulators, different type of um, photonic devices. Um, of uh, 160 nanometer and um, different silicon th thickness um, for uh, electronic devices. Um, the, the, the box isolation, I would say, is a rather standard among uh, silicon photonic, it's a two micrometer. Uh, we also integrated um, germanium detectors and, and uh, silicon nitride, uh, silicon nitride waveguide. Um, besides that, uh, we we also have developed a um, silt uh, silt air gap uh, to increase um, um, heater efficiency. Later, I will talk a little bit more about this um, this kind of uh, 
devices or I would say in a technological improvement um, in order to remove the, the substrate below below the uh, oxide box to, to improve um, efficiency of, uh, of thermal tuning. And um, on top of that, uh, we have quite advanced uh, progress and uh, developed um, um, fiber attachment. Uh, on, the, on the right hand side, you see the, the big roof. Uh, to enable um, uh, low loss uh, fiber array in, uh, optical IO, and on on the um, uh, on the left hand side, um, uh, you see also a kind of schematic uh, uh, representing our work on integrating um, laser source. Uh, I mean, flip chipping laser um, to to the waveguide. So it's not only placing on the waveguide, but also um, working with the different mo mode conversion and uh, trying as efficient as possible a um, uh, couple couple light uh, from the flip chip laser um, to to the waveguides um with with um, advanced um, advanced lithography and actually uh, improving the, the the process because the, the this 45 nanometer uh, process is actually inherit quite a lot of knowledge and experience from the 90 nanometer um, so uh, in this process, we we, we also use an um, advanced litho uh, immersion litho lithography for pattern and uh, key uh, key component uh, uh, photonic component. Also using an OPC correction to make sure that uh, we achieve uh, you know uh, low loss and uh, pretty much state of the art in, um, devices. And as, as you know, any, any, any surface, surface roughness, et cetera, are uh, extremely uh, important for um, uh, optical um, properties of the devices, ma ma mainly loads. So um, advanced, advanced um, LITO and edge process, uh, which actually is coming with, with um, Global Foundry State of the Art uh, FAB uh, in, in, in Malta, actually uh, improve significantly this device and performance comparing to, uh, to, to, to other technologies, uh, especially older ones. And uh, maybe last uh, important aspect um, how, how actually used in the practice. So we, we enabled a full uh, freeform design and uh, with curved linear GTS, uh, so uh, no Manhattanization of the of the waveguide, but uh, designer can can actually work on the smooth smooth shapes, and and uh, together with the OPC, this is actually uh, actually what you get in, in the in the silicon. Um. So. Uh, what are what are actually um, our target target applications? Uh, so um, uh, primary, primary, we we working and actually this talk would be more more of, um, more about the um, kind of data center application. So uh, putting putting silicon photonics in the, in the short range uh, connection, um, uh, enabling you know um, low power, high bandwidth um, um, transceiver. But um, de depending indeed on the application, different type of the devices uh, could could be used uh, for the 5G telecom. Uh, it's going a little bit longer distance, and going to to co, co, co package optics, um, which is actually a uh, high priority also in in uh, in development. Uh, different different building blocks to enable uh, high performance computing. Uh, artificial intelligence uh, going to the uh, lidar automotive. Those are kind of uh, primary um, primary focus of the of the GIF development and uh, building blocks. And uh, our older technology, 90WG, actually were were covering um, most of them. Um, 45 SPC law, uh, the one the one I'm, I'm I'm talking about it right now is actually bringing um, significant improvement in terms of the performance, but also enabling. Um, uh, new functionality, and uh, especially here, um, looking for the uh, co-package co optics and and short reach um, interconnect. So, what what we, what we offer in this technology in the in the wafer, you can actually um, uh, fabricate a uh, bunch of different type of devices on the wafer and put them in a in a different configuration to to build a transceiver. To build a sensing system, and also for for for, for lidar, 
uh, we, we have actually in, in this image kind of try to uh, summarize all of them and group uh, between a little bit um, merge in the in the CMOS part purely related to maybe maybe more and um, like um, electronics and where you can can build an um, uh, RF transistor actually you, you have all um, all um, all standard uh, building blocks coming from the Sun CMOS foundry uh, if you uh, transistor uh, uh, all the IO cells in to, to build the chip, communicate, and uh, on top of that the transistor, you can actually build build uh, usable electronic circuits, driver, um, TIA, uh, any any other logic that is required um, uh, for uh, to, to to control um, um, any chip. In the back end, uh, you have um, uh, passive inductors and and uh, capacitors used for the embedding. Also, very key key aspect is the, the copper pillar and, and receiving parts uh, that will actually enable uh, to enhance the uh, chip integration. So, um, on top of the on top of photonics, you can still place um, place your uh, host IC, uh, which would which would uh, you know um, do some functional uh, with with a specific function. Next to next to the, the the photonic devices, we have a bunch of um, uh, photonic uh, photonic devices, uh, Maxander module, Ma Maxander ring modulators, uh, WDM filters, detectors, uh, all uh, huge family of different type of waveguides, uh, whether it's a silicon or silicon nitride, um, uh, bands, tapers, couplers, uh, conversion, crossing, uh, whatever whatever is really needed to. To route um, your optical signal uh, in the silicon, um, thermal phase shifter um, with and or without an um, undercut for thermal tuning. Uh, as we all know, silicon is is um, uh, very sensitive for the temperature, so uh, those uh, devices are um, extremely extremely important. Uh, besides uh, dense WDM filters, we 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 also have a multiplexer and multiplexer based on the Maxander lattice. Mm, uh, also, what is what is important is the uh, polarizator splitters and and rotators. Um, so so this actually expand functionality. Uh, what you could do either for uh, bit lots of coherent light depending on the polarization. Or to uh, ensure uh, that you don't lose um, power, uh, optical power, uh, when, when when unknown or different polarization is is uh, signal is coming coming to the chip. And then uh, finally, a little bit of the uh, optical I/O um, uh, standard grating couplers, um, which uh, where you can provide from the from the surface uh, to the to the optical signal to the to the wafer or an uh, edge fiber couplers uh, with passive uh, with passive alignment enabling um, uh, attaching array so this is uh, allows you to to really put um, uh, multiple fibers um, uh, to the chip and then uh, as, as, as a also a reference we're working on the direct um, laser attachment uh, so to to be able actually in uh, flip chip uh, flip chip um, uh, laser to the chip that actually uh, provide them the source of the uh, optical power and um, all this actually the the building blocks uh, presented here and, it's, um, and what I would like to talk um, uh, later are actually focusing on the um, data communication and um, co package optics. So let's let's dive now a little bit into the uh, silicon photonic transceiver. On this uh, schematic on the on the right hand side, uh, I'd like to show you the, the communication uh, between two packages um, uh, with the fiber array and uh, using using fiber couplers uh, edge couplers between them. And as, as a kind of a schematic, uh, we can we can imagine um, you know uh, a light source uh, either either integrated on the chip or could be actually put put outside. Uh, if we have a capability to integrate, why not to put it? Uh, and uh, that's a that's a kind of typical communication between um, two two packages. Uh, but as as we could move uh, actually forward um, in the time or the future needs. There might be also uh, required communication within the package. Uh, currently, currently is uh, realized in the electrical way, 
uh, but yeah, why not? Why not? It's also using optical communication between um, two two host uh, host ICs and um, sitting on the same package. And of course, depending depending on the uh, communication, depending on the distance uh, between two packages or uh, within the package, there are different requirements uh, in terms of the, the energy efficiency and uh, data rate latency and etc. Especially especially the the, the close um, close distance that require really low low latency between between the communication. So let's look at um, some some transceiver key key requirements. Um, when we start with the silicon photonic, uh, of course we need we need the, the, the key component uh, for for that, which is um, very fast, energy efficient, um, optical modulator, and preferably also a small factor, so we can squeeze actually a lot of them um, uh, on the chip to enable multiple channels, uh, either going uh, WDM or, or the serial ring. The next comp component uh, we need to match uh, match with the uh, high speed bandwidth photo detectors. So um, uh, here is also uh, advantages could be use uh, also avalanche uh, photo di uh, diodes um, that could that could increase the, the sensitivity. Um, and well, th th those are key active components, but we cannot actually forget also about the uh, passive devices. And here we really need to uh, improve all the losses in the in the silicon photonic link. So, uh, waveguide losses, coupling powers, uh, coupling losses should be really minimized. And because um, every single uh, dB of the loss is is a key key aspect um, for this for this transceiver, especially if you want to lower uh, to build an uh, energy efficient transceiver, which means a um, lower optical power. And then um, finally, polarizator splitters, rotators, in order to actually deal with those polariz polarizations, uh, is extremely extremely important. Um, next, next will be electronics, and and here we have actually pretty much um, uh, gr group of um, group of uh, devices like the analog uh, RF transistor in order to build a high speed um, transit signal amplifier either in the CMOS or, or by CMOS, uh, we need to transmit also th those uh, data in the electrical domain or provide to the modulators or, or, or vice versa. So um, uh, low loss transmission lines um, are, are really key components um, inductors uh, to, to, to boost boost the speed, extend the bandwidth and actually build, build analog circuits. Uh, so uh, you need to have also in the technology really um, uh, are a friendly are a friendly backend that that enables to build up um, and uh, preferably low parasitics between CMOS and the silicon photonics uh, and actually here the monolithic integration uh, brings that uh, quite nicely because you can actually fabricate photonics and uh, very very close to your um, um, to, to to the CMOS uh, to CMOS electronics so any any driving uh, power is not being used to reload uh, any parasitic capacitances but uh, directly uh, directly controlling the, the the modulators so this is definitely an uh, improvement in in efficiency and like in any any uh, high performance uh, efficient system uh, the best way uh, you can achieve it by by actually co-design uh, electronics uh, to to really match your um, photonics, uh, matching the same bandwidth um, uh, will definitely improve uh, performance, especially looking at the uh, figure of merit. And then um, finally, um, heaters and thermal tuning algorithms. So uh, photonic devices, especially in the in the silicon, they are thermally sensitive, so you do have to tune them. And um, sometimes, uh, sometimes logic for the tuning uh, could be relatively uh, big in terms of the silicon area, uh, way bigger than standalone photonic components or, or even electronic drivers. And um, so, so scaling, scaling this this components in order to enable multiple channel uh, may may be indeed um, challenging. And um, the the last package uh, I would say uh, would be the the, the packaging solution. Uh, so here um, we need to enable uh, laser integration. Uh, wh why it's why it's needed? Having having integrated laser on the chip will enable to uh, to um, uh, improve the bandwidth density per, per per chip area, 
uh, you have your light source integrated together with the with the transceiver any thermal grid will will actually uh, affect affect the laser but fortunately in in, in similar direction so laser integration uh, um, with with uh, low loss uh, uh, coupling between light source plus plus any, any stabilization is indeed indeed required and then in order to take the data on off the chip um, uh, optical io and uh, um, high density and um, uh, fiber attachment uh, preferably um, passive uh, so in, in order to enable um, uh, high throughput and um, uh, uh, fiber attachment so in 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 actually this is this is our um, view uh, to into into build the sigma photon transceiver and this is what we actually uh, what we have enabled in in 45 um, nanometer spclo um, technology node so what are our uh, scaling options um, in here? Um, and we have actually, uh, as, you, as you well know, a couple of the options to increase uh, transceiver bandwidth. We can play with the modulation scheme. We can play with the speed uh, or baud rate of the, of the transceiver and also apply um, different multiplexing schemes to, 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 to boost the bandwidth. And then choice or the combination um, is, is not really trivial and it requires from, from the technology and um, definitely a couple of the, of the en enablement. Um, so so like, like modulation scheme, uh, it's pretty much uh, application dependent uh, because, because uh, it directly affects the, the, the latency. Um, uh, and and uh, wh whether you're going long distance or the short distance, so, so uh, we have option here if they are going uh, NRZ type of the modulation. So this is really one of the, the simplest uh, for, for for the transmission. This is really preferable for the sh short reach distance, and when when we don't want to waste any additional time on um, uh, on uh, error correction, for instance. Um, uh, if 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 we're going a longer distance, um, then then and want to increase the bandwidth, probably PAM4 or a QAM co coherent signal, they should really um, uh, actually they are used, and in in, in the second photon it can be also in, in similar way used. So in, in this way, by by the changing the modulation scheme, we can um, boost the bandwidth. Um, uh, the, the of course, depending 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 on the application which and uh, which can allow. And um, in the in the modulation speed, uh, this is actually uh, could be limited by by the speed of our uh, either modulators, photonic devices, or the uh, electronics. And uh, typically, each each technology has its own uh, sweet spot to operate in order to properly optimize uh, efficiency of the driver. For instance, versus um, versus versus bitrate, uh, but here, if if needed, uh, you could use some bandwidth um, technique to to boost the bandwidth. Uh, use use inductors, for instance, to to extend the bandwidth of the TIA or the driver. Um, uh, but this this will uh, consume not only a little bit of more energy, uh, more power, uh, but but also silicon area. So scaling uh, scaling multiple channels may be in here um, challenging. And so that's why that's why the other option is um, to uh, use different multiplexing scheme. Wavelength division multiplexing is um, one of the the most, uh, um, uh, you know, could be could be most common uh, when you put multiple uh, wavelengths, multiple color light uh, to to transmit. And then of course you have to uh, multiple and um, put multiple uh, transceivers. And if you put multiple colors into one waveguide, then additionally you need to have um, uh, those those components actually very well um, developed uh, to do the multiplexing and then do the multiplexing. And also depending on the uh, on the type of uh, CWD and Delta GDM, they, they they may also consume and uh, some some significant area in the silicon chip, and uh, also uh, require decoding possibly thermal tuning. So there is there are some consequences with, with going with the dense WDM. Uh, spatial division multiplexing, putting pretty much uh, multiple lines, uh, it's also valid solution. 
and uh, especially if you want to stay within the chip, like uh, within the package communication, uh, waveguide uh, wave are, are, are very narrow. So uh, per, per millimeter square, you could, you could imagine putting multiple of them, um, uh, putting multiple of them in, uh, uh, to, to communicate, might make it actually tra transmission simpler. You don't have to deal with uh, uh, decoding decoding signal or splitting the wavelength just directly modulate the signal and 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 send send to detector there are other multiplex uh, multiplexing scheme like in the time division uh, polarization multi uh, polarization multiplexing so that's why uh, also this polarization splitter rotators are actually quite quite important and uh, components i think there was um, uh, some 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 question about the about the latency for the longer distance and um, maybe i can comment on that immediately uh, so when, when when you're transmitting data over over longer distance, uh, the the time required for any error correction decoding um, is becoming proportionally smaller to the time of fly. So sending data over over kilometers, it it takes takes some time, and the the time required to actually decode or put additional circuitry. And uh, for for error correction or even power power overhead associated with that uh, with, with, with with this error correction, and is becoming uh, negligible uh, comparing to the benefits what you have with the higher order of the modulation scheme in order to send those data. So the main benefits you you doubling quadrupling amount of um, amount of bit uh, sent sent over over the long distance. When we look at the very short uh, connection, like uh, we can imagine, for instance, optical link between uh, CPU and, and memory. So, so here, uh, yeah, the, the, the computing unit need to really ask for the for the data immediately, and they have to come. And there is no time really to to figure it out if the data from the memory came okay or not, or re-ask again. Please send send again package. Uh, so the short distance should be very simple. And in terms of the communication, uh, no delay and uh, bit error rate has to be extremely low. So there is no errors on, on the line. Over the long distance, when the package is coming, uh, uh, the, the transmission protocol may be different. And probably depending on the application, if the data came corrupted or distorted, uh, you can you can ask uh, you can ask uh, sender to, to 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 resend the package if something if something came, came, came wrong right so let's look a little bit at the, at the integration scheme and what we can do and uh, i have actually uh, a couple of the schematics um, looking at the two type of uh, integration first one is hybrid when when you have a uh, hybrid because uh, there is a clear separation between electronics and the photonics and uh, this is kind of uh, standard or maybe i would say that the most common uh, type of integration when you when you fabricate all your photonic devices in the um, in the one process and um, another uh, another chip uh, will be acting as a controller uh, plus probably also host uh, with some sp specific specific I IC. Um, so uh, what we could could imagine here, uh, we have a, a flip chip integrated laser source, uh, multiple wavelength uh, with with laser couplers, um, some 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 splitters. Um, in here in here, um, I, I, I just want to as, a, as an example imagine some some transmission and um, on chip. Uh, where, where you where you use, for instance, a ring-based uh, modulator, and uh, with with thermal tuning, uh, drop port, monitor port, uh, for for the thermal tuning, and of course, electronic has to be uh, it's 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 not a monolithic process, so electronic has to be put put somewhere else, um, probably probably host uh, host IC have to take care of that, and. Uh, so, so um, we need to we need to send um, set electrical signal from the detector, um, uh, especially for the thermal stabilization control uh, unit, um, to to the host. And uh, I see uh, on the on the input uh, we, we additionally put some additional uh, ESD protection uh, to to protect the gate of the transistor in order to give a um, uh, for the thermal tuning. And the same way uh, driver as an example. 
uh, control control the links has to go from the uh, some flipship integration package uh, maybe maybe TSV in, in, in some some process uh, micro bumps and um, etc and uh, such a way uh, can control a driver and if the distance is relatively short probably you know direct connection and uh, of the waveguide to uh, so this could be an SDM type of a transceiver to the to the detector and you know some far away part of the chip and uh, where we have the detector ESD and and uh, electronic electronic circuitry transit balance amplifier limit amplifier uh, some and the DC realizer that we can transmit data from the one one to another host but if you want to go uh, leave leave the chip then uh, leave the chip probably probably using the wdm scheme so pretty much uh, repeating repeating the same the same sequence uh, over multiple multiple type of um, rings multiple wavelengths and then use the fiber couple um, to to leave the chip uh, to the uh, you know to go to the next package and um, so that that could be well that that would be the scenario if the if the hybrid hybrid integration in the monolithic in the, you you see that uh, once we have you no know, capability to build some some uh, electronic circuitry next to the photonics we can actually put the key key functional block um, together and um, we we may need some uh, controlling tuning uh, tuning circuitry for the laser to to regulate the power and this one can be actually directly inter integrated with the monolithic platform. Uh, the same driver uh, feedback control uh, of the of the um, uh, active active devices, uh, modulator detectors, and uh, they are actually implemented already in in the in the, um, in the monolithic silicon photonic um, wafer, and uh, including serializer and deserializer. So when, when, when you place, place um, uh, your host uh, IC on top of it, um, for, for it, it could be even, even transparent, you know, uh, what is below. Uh, you, you could think about the uh, second photonic uh, uh, wafer below as a, as a kind of active, active interposer, send the data, uh, provide the data to, to, the, to the specific parts, which actually they, they don't even have, you know, the standard IO. Uh, what is what is placed on the IO chip typically typically at the edges, but from any any place of the driver uh, it can pick up the data with with actually the speed what is the most comfortable for the for that particular ASIC or the functionality could be a few gigabits per second could be could be more depending depending on the application, and um, rest rest is actually taken care of um, uh, this active uh, silicon photon interposer that that actually uh, can can serialize the data. Send it and and receive it and then provide it provide it to the chip. So um, I would say that that would be the one of the main advantages of the monolithic technology, uh, because if you want to uh, realize some uh, specific function in the um, uh, you need you need additional uh, additional uh, ASIC chip you would like to stack uh, flip chip or stack uh, together with the photonics. So um, that, that chip has to not only provide I mean, technology use for, for, for that chip, not only to, to use the specific function which you want to have, for instance, what is the speech, but also, also you need to drive um, uh, uh, photonic components. So uh, the technology matching should be kind of suitable for both uh, the functionality you want to achieve uh, plus, plus driving, um, driving the photonics. Okay. So, question: um, How fast we could go? And and um, so here, I'm, as you can see, I divided into the couple couple of the blocks uh, and and quickly uh, want to discuss uh, or, or think about the about the limits. Normally, we don't think about the passive devices as a really really speed limit because it's a passive; it doesn't act. Um, um, uh, affect directly the, the modulation speed, but actually, actually it does uh, by by the loss. Uh, and and uh, while while uh, for the passive devices waveguides, uh, it doesn't matter how fast you you modulate your your light, and um, it may be indirect uh, affecting the the capability of the your transceiver um, uh, by um, uh, by the losses. So. 
having having you know a re reduction of the loss allows you to also uh, reduce or actually work with the same laser power if you want to meet specific energy efficiency of the transmitter which means uh, your your signal to noise ratio uh, on the on the electronics especially on the receiver side could be higher which means you may you may achieve higher OMA a better bit error rate so so uh, losses on the passive devices are actually extremely important uh, for the um, high performance system uh, where, where where increasing signal to noise ratio increasing OMA um, is is needed in terms of the modulator, uh, you know, primarily we're working with the carrier depletion uh, type of the modulators, and uh, based based on based on the PN junction uh, diodes uh, PN junction by by moving moving the carriers. And here literature and uh, just as as, as an example uh, showed that uh, there is there's kind of speed limit to to those devices. So, so typically, typically you could go get a bandwidth probably up to 50, maybe exceeding a little bit of 50, 50 gigahertz with some some compromises, um, and maybe 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 electron absorption or uh, silicon germanium uh, could go could go a little bit higher, uh, higher. But here I'm, uh, I showed some couple of uh, examples uh, what what has been um, demonstrated. So from the silicon. And I think this is one 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 of the highest um, I have found with the PAM4 uh, modulation with 160 uh, gigabits per second. But of course, um, uh, the always the always key aspect is uh, you know what is your bit error rate. Uh, so so some numbers are acceptable for the longer distance, for the shorter they might be not acceptable because the error rate is way too high, and um, for 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 short maybe maybe for the short range communication. But in general, like a 50, 50 gigahertz uh, seems to be uh, quite quite achievable. Uh, you can push push even faster and uh, sending either more, more more data by increasing the, the um, modulation scheme. But but typically has a huge huge effect uh, for for the bit error rate. I think short shorter range distance, depending on the kind of application aspect, might have a bit error rate up to uh, one e minus 13, one e minus 15. So it's a several order of magnitude. Uh, lower, lower, lower than this one. Um, next aspect is the, the detector. So here, here is uh, optimization of uh, of the performance. We would like to have a very fast dam, so pretty much uh, short short transit time whenever the the photon is being absorbed and electron holes generated, and also uh, high absorption. And the primary primary work is actually on the um, uh, germanium and the silicon. Uh, we also have demonstrated very fast, um, very fast detector uh, detectors here. But there are also some some other materials uh, entering um, that area, like a free five. Um, it, it's of course uh, making making the process complex, and definitely uh, this could be considered as a next generation of the either detectors or using free five for 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 modulators, even even monotonically integrated light sources. Um, but probably it would be uh, considered as a next generation. Um, packaging, packaging. Uh, so uh, pretty much the uh, fiber array density uh, affected the speed. So how many fibers per per millimeter you can uh, you can uh, attached. So pr pretty much the pitch between the fibers and you know complexity of the integration. Uh, probably also the techniques and and the passive alignment uh, will may have a quite kind of impact because uh, with passive alignment you can actually produce. Uh, way more transceiver than than active alignment, and they will be simply cheaper. So there is a huge benefit in the benefit of it. And in terms of electronics, uh, as I mentioned, each electronic has its own sweet spot. Um, you could you could push electronic faster, but there is always uh, some penalty, and the penalty is in the area. Uh, so like like using for instance inductors so will consume your m m more area. Which means uh, per per millimeter area you can squeeze less channels or less, for instance, transceivers, but you could go faster, and also um, uh, with uh, power consumption, so uh, energy efficiency may drop uh, may drop because you you can go actually a little bit faster. Um, next section and um, a little bit about the photonics blocks and and then optical IO how we can how we can um, enable high speed high speed transceiver. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in, in, in our uh, technology, we, we enable copper pillars and the receiver parts. So this is actually allows you um, uh, stack 
and do the um, electrical um, electrical interconnect between between the two chips. So this is provides uh, to currently two and half D uh, integration. So on top of the monolithic platform, which you can still use to integrate your functionality, you can still um, uh, place place your uh, host IC. Uh, in the same way, it's a it's a laser attached demonstration. Uh, when you when you clip chip and for instance indium phosphide uh, laser this might be uh, extremely extremely important when you must have um, a lot of uh, laser source not only data com but also a uh, laser application or or, um, uh, or the computing and then um, the one schematic on the on the on the right hand side uh, shows a um, uh, B groove uh, process uh, when when you when you, and and actually the the fiber attachment so the, the, the key development um, is here is to uh, enable low loss coupling uh, between between fiber and then uh, uh, photonic chip uh, together um, um, together with the passive alignment. So so it's important also have a very high uh, throughput of of uh, um, attaching um, attaching the the fiber array to the chip. And then we, 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 with scaling, uh, we also we also working to uh, to improve the pitch. So number of channels um, that can be attached uh, can, can 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 go higher. In this in this technology, we we actually have to look not only on the uh, uh, photonic side, uh, which which is actually uh, front end of the line, middle of the line when you have a you know all the optical action is, is happening, but also but also at the at the back end. And we have a here a quite quite rich backend uh, nine nine level uh, of uh, metallization, and and it's actually do, do you need it or, or not? And uh, we actually um, have put quite quite a lot of thought uh, how to actually enable the, this backend um, uh, to kind of uh, provide all necessary uh, you know um, uh, stuff you need to build a high performance um, transceiver. Uh, so. Uh, we, we are enabling a five level of, of um, metallization uh, with thinner metal. This is actually uh, extremely important if you want to build some logic stuff. You, you need a certain metal level to, for, for the routing connection logic gate. Uh, so uh, that, that controls the laser. Uh, they can control um, thermal tuning circuitry or, or may realize uh, any, any other function. And then at the same time, it is good to have uh, also uh, RF friendly backend. So you can build your transmission line. Um, you can build, uh, for instance, Max Zender modulator, uh, which is actually required also uh, creating transmission line, but also send, send the uh, uh, data in the electrical domain. So, so you know, you have a different different level of the thicknesses. Uh, of course, it also uh, with the thickness of the metal, um, it's a different uh, different pitch. So, so typically thinner, thinner metals allows you to, to uh, make a smaller pitch between the metallization. So it's perfect, perfect for the logic. But however, as you can see on the, on the some, some simulation modeling of the transmission line, um, thin metal has a way more higher um, loss than the thicker metal. And pretty much uh, all those layers could be really nicely, nicely used either to build the transmission line but also uh, inductors, but also actually distribute the power uh, properly across across the chip. Um, in terms of the photonic devices, um, as, as I mentioned, uh, we have it here quite quite of experience actually working on them. And on the right hand side, you can see kind of a big portfolio of uh, various type of the devices coming from the straight wave guide and uh, papers between uh, fully edge or partially edge waveguide, uh, silicon, silicon nitride couplers, uh, edge couplers, band crossing. So this is actually all our library of the, of the different building blocks uh, that you can use uh, to, to, to build the chip. And going from the, from the different technologies um, in the past, uh, changing, improving the process, um, um, we've been actually also uh, improving waveguide losses. And depending on the type of the waveguide, uh, silicon waveguide uh, or, or silicon nitride waveguide, you can actually really um, reduce this loss. And uh, yeah, we've been demonstrating, you know, going uh, below half dB per centimeter and of the of the uh, of the waveguide loss. And actually, with uh, any, any further process improvement, 
um, uh, this value can actually uh, go 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 lower, uh, trying to 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 reach them on uh, material limits. Um, one 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 slide on the uh, detectors. Um, uh, as I mentioned, this is one of the key block uh, for 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 um, for high speed transceiver. Uh, we're working and we we have developed. Um, germanium uh, PN diode. Uh, it can work in actually different configuration, um, uh, with a single input or or uh, dual input. Um, you you may actually uh, might be actually very very uh, favorable su such such an input for the WDM uh, system and and on the receiver side when when you know each side of the of the waveguide can actually work with di different type of the polarization. Um, anyway, anyway, in the, in the table, actually showing couple couple of the uh, our target target performance for for for, uh, for these detectors. Uh, we're looking actually here at the two two type of detectors, and there is the difference a little bit different between the between the responsivity in, in the in the op and minus one volt, but there is also also trade off uh, trade off in the bandwidth. So. Uh, what, what, once we know how to actually trade properly the bandwidth um, for the responsivity, it's it's easier to um, kind of um, match the device to your specific application. And um, if you if you don't require such a high bandwidth, uh, probably it's not really needed or recommended to have a, a higher bandwidth detector because the noise integration um, is 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 larger uh, proportional to the bandwidth. And uh, so, uh, so if you want to, for instance, go uh, at different speed, it's, it's better to match and um, match the bandwidth um, of the detector and then TIA um, uh, matching your speed. So your noise figure, and in this case, um, is is better. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, about the um, sealed sealed undercut module uh, that we that we have enabled and. This module is extremely uh, important uh, when we're working with the photonic devices, especially for the thermal tuning. By 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 removing uh, by by um, opening making opening in the buried oxide, um, we can we can remove the silicon underneath the box, creating gap and may, maybe better call it sealed gap because later in the process is 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 being closed. And, and having having that uh, that trick allows you to significantly increase efficiency of your of your thermal tuning. And um, and below uh, you can you can see some uh, some modeling data um, of of structure actually in the cross section like this. When you have uh, two heaters on the both sides and the wave in the center, and the box is is, is removed underneath. Uh, so uh, whenever you have a silicon, uh, unfortunately, a lot of lot of heat uh, is actually being dissipated um, vertically um, to the to the substrate. And when there is um, uh, where is the undercut, uh, you can actually uh, achieve the same temperature, uh, the same temperature on the waveguide uh, if you want to thermally thermally tune it uh, with with uh, way way lower um, uh, power and uh, the 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 difference is close to four to five x uh, improvement with with sealed undercut heater, and uh, such a sam uh, sample of the of the device, and uh, you can see here uh, where the waveguide uh, silicon waveguide is passing through, and those are and uh, different length of the segments uh, of the of the resistor, and uh, where where you can um, and provide them uh, electrical power to to that uh, to the to the resistor. And by changing length of number segments, you can also play with with different resistance depending on your um, driving schemes. Could be could be very low of couple of ohms to to, to hundreds ohms or, or more. Um, another key key component um, active would be would be micro ring uh, modulator, and and here we we actually uh, look at the different type of the modulators. And with the vertical p injunction or the lateral p injunction, the the, the key. Um, I think there was already a couple of the talks uh, describing in details modulators, so I just want to uh, cover really really briefly uh, the, this aspect. 
Uh, so uh, vertical modulators, you can see uh, it, the junction is created in a, in a little bit different way than, than the standard lateral one. Uh, you have a, a way or longer dep depletion region, which means that the mode overlap, uh, the mode interaction with the depletion region is, is uh, significantly higher. And this type, uh, this type of the modulator uh, in general uh, should, should provide you better, uh, better performance. So, um, in, in, in the simulation um, framework uh, we, we have we have done, um, uh, you see the, the the kind of cloud of different different type of the phase shifter uh, based on the um, vertical pin junction in, in uh, orange and green, um, uh, plotted. Uh, so here here we plot the the transmitter penalty of the uh, of the um, uh, uh, ring modulator, which is actually defined as an OMA normalized to the Two times input, uh, two times input power in the logarithmic scale. Uh, we look at the at the maximum OMA you can achieve from the from the modulator. Um, so so when when you when you uh, modulate between two different voltages, uh, there is a there is a specific wavelength on the slope when the difference between uh, transmitted bit one and bit two is maximum. Uh, this this kind of maximum difference corresponds to a um, minimum transmitter penalty for for this wavelength, which means you can you can get uh, the highest extinction ratio and the lowest insertion loss. Um, you may you may imagine so in this case in this case operating at th this point uh, would correspond to like a 6.4 and 3.3 and um, uh, extinction ratio insertion loss. You may you may actually imagine that if you go to the to the resonance, then indeed your extinction ratio will be will be higher, and indeed at the resonance your extinction ratio is higher. It's over could be over 15 dB or or you know uh, uh, as deep the, the the resonance goes, but also your insertion loss higher uh, comparing to the to the other point. So actually the the transmitter penalty is is worse in that point, and an OMA is also lower. So, so in in this graph, we we, we um, uh, what, what I want to show you is that this um, performance improvement uh, between different type of the junction, you can you can get uh, probably one one one, one or over over two dB uh, improvement in the transmitter penalty, which means uh, pretty much directly OMA, and um, between those two those two junctions. However, there is of course the drawback with the VPN, with the larger larger depletion, which we actually want to have it to better uh, interact with the mode. Uh, we have also larger RC constant. Um, so, so actually, the the the, the performance uh, uh, at the higher speed might be actually limited, uh, significantly limited by the the RC cutoff uh, frequency, uh, and not only um, photon cavity lifetime uh, related to to the to the modulator. But um, anyway, uh, our our actually uh, development target for such an application is to work with the ring, um, uh, to to for instance enable um, uh, 1.6 terahertz um, FSR, uh, which which could correspond to 7.5 micrometer um, uh, 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 ring radius. So uh, with 1.6 terahertz, you could you could enable, uh, for instance, eight channels and uh, with 200 gigahertz uh, gigahertz spacing. And so uh, we have we have enabled actually the the, the ring resonator with uh, thermal tuning heaters could be put placed and internally externally and as well um, you can use the drop ports to to, to monitor and uh, operating point of the of the ring and in in the in the objective uh, of course uh, for us is to is to actually work with um, uh, both type of the VPNs also depending depending application the primary. And the, the more the more efficient with the VPN, it probably will be a little bit slower. You know, working up to 35 gigahertz with LPN junction, you could probably push uh, push faster. But uh, there would be there would be some some compromise in, in compromise on, on the speed. And then actually the 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 development of this device indeed you you always want to maximize maximize OMA um, of the of the modulator to make make sure that. Um, this value is the highest because it has a direct input on the, um, on, 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 the, on the receiver. And we're also looking at a different type of um, uh, application, uh, 2.4 or 3.2 terahertz FSR, so pretty much shrinking, shrinking the, these rings. So um, you can squeeze more channels uh, in, in, in case of the WDM uh, system. 
Um, it's also important to, to mention about the uh, uh, WBM filters. Uh, so here is here is example of um, of uh, second order um, uh, ring filters when the um, all colors actually passing 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 through the through the wave gate and each channel and um, has to drop uh, one specific wavelength uh, using using for instance second order uh, channel filters uh, may may allow you for the collective tuning uh, they they are actually uh, coming very very nicely placed equally spaced across. And, and across the the, the wave, wavelengths, uh, so if needed uh, some tuning and for the uh, you, you can actually apply the collective tuning instead of uh, tuning them individually. So which definitely makes your um, uh, thermal tuning system uh, way way simpler, uh, which is actually important. You can uh, save save some area. Um, in the silicon for for uh, another functionality TIAs, um, uh, etc. So um, low loss, uh, of course, uh, loss of the filter is one of the key aspects. So we don't want to uh, lo lose any, any loss. And I think typical spec is is below three dB. Um, you know, objective is to achieve uh, be better than that. But as as we're working with the silicon, you know, the uh, crosstalk. Uh, is is also a very important factor. So um, you know uh, such a things like you know the physical distance between each channel is also very important and has to be taken into consideration. Even if you apply uh, like a collective tuning, uh, delivering heat between all the devices, they they um, well we may have a simply cross talk. So uh, like like the, the 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 channels in the middle uh, may have you know maybe warmer than the channels at the edge. So it's, such a thing has to be also taken into account uh, in, in into uh, working working on the design. So um, I think I'm running slowly out of time. I want to jump based some some example of of um, ring base ring base transceiver, which actually uh, in in example may, may look like this when you have a, a laser source uh, could be monolithically integrated. I mean could be clip chip or, or off chip. And, and the multiple wavelength passing through the single bus, uh, acting, uh, working with the uh, ring, ring modulator. Mm. We can actually put more modulator on the on the one wavelength because it's a very narrow band um, device. Uh, so so it, it operates uh, interact only with a specific specific wavelength. I use IO, IOSMF uh, for the uh, communication between two packages, and and on the receiver side we need polarization. Uh, uh, splitter uh, rotator uh, because because uh, if if you lose the information of the polarization, we don't know how much TETM mode is there. So it's better to convert um, the path. Both uh, one path will be path for the TE, the other path for the TM. And now we can uh, take advantage of of using um, double um, uh, double input uh, detector. So whenever whenever power is was uh, actually transmitted in the T TM mode, which was converted to TE, will be fed to the to the device, so we are not losing um, in such a scenario any power. Of course, it's important to make sure that uh, the phase phase is matching um, in the in the device, so the length uh, length are um, are equal or adjusted properly. So, uh, what would be this uh, in this case an um, aggregated bandwidth? So we can still uh, what what I showed you uh, a little bit earlier. We can play with different different type of uh, tricks to increase the bandwidth, a modulation speed, a modulation scheme, and uh, multiplexing. So in the in the first first row. So um, uh, with 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 this technology, in order to to enable you know uh, efficient uh, transmission with with low uh, bit error rate like like one e minus fifteen, uh, we should be very comfortable going with the 50, 50, 56 gigabyte per second. And depending on the type of uh, type of the modulation scheme, NRZ or PAM4, um, and in this case, um, uh, what, what what we what we actually enabled eight channels WBM, and um, we can we can achieve number of bits per line, which we have you know close to uh, close to tera terabit uh, per second, half terabit per second if you go NRZ, um, uh, or like a point point nine terabit per second um, for PAM, and if you go with the PAM4 communication. 
and um, depending uh, currently enable 200 um, micrometer pitch for the fiber arrays and if we use four fibers in that case per, per millimeter and um, the total uh, edge throughput um, would be uh, you know close to two or uh, three and a half um, terabits per second per, per millimeter but um, uh, in, in, in the technology we can actually push faster we already seen um, uh, that that photonic devices are capable of it uh, detectors are uh, over 60 gigabit per second and with, with also modulators, um, uh, for instance, LPN type uh, 60, uh, 64 gigabyte per second uh, shouldn't be a problem to achieve um, uh, modulation speed. And again, when we, when we, uh, when we go between NRZ and SPAM4, at SPAM4 um, we, and the eight channels WTM, we can, we can already reach uh, one terabit. Uh, per second per line. And if we combine this with like 127 pitch fiber, um, fiber attachment and then eight channels, the total uh, total edge uh, chip throughput uh, could, could be four, four or eight um, terabits per second uh, per, per, per millimeter of the, of the chip. And in the next generation, that's, that's also what, what we are actually um, looking for. And um, the, the way the way to, to boost the speed is of course uh, try to boost the, the modulation speed. There was also uh, earlier shown um, a reference to some papers, 80 gigabyte per second, with, with for instance Ma uh, Max Zender modulator, um, uh, by by using uh, some some tricks or actually enabling next generation technology, silicon germanium, HBT transistor, uh, maybe CMOS, CMOS bipolar. Um, you could you could boost uh, boost the speed uh, of of electronics to to like 112, and, and on top of that, you know we can we can still play uh, with modulation schemes. Um, uh, definitely, definitely, next generation should increase a uh, number of wavelength in the multiplexing. So definitely, the the channel channel density and um, will, will will go higher, and and the edge throughput uh, will be will be quite um, uh, quite quite significant. Um, on the one of I think the, the the last slide I have it here some some example um, uh, of of the power budget uh, what we did some uh, calculation computation how much um, how much each component will will affect um, so so typically typically when when you look at the power budget um, you look at the at the detector or start calculating from the from the receiver side so how much power how much OMA and um, uh, power I need here to achieve a specific uh, specific bit error rate if you want to when to go. So so like like in in this in this example, um, uh, we want to get the uh, bit error rate on the level of one e one e fifteen. Um, uh, so so we need to have a specific a specific IMA um, uh, of uh, uh, on 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 the photodiode, right? So um, Q factor or the you know I, I Q factor should be should be probably around above above seven, and on the on the NRZI uh, in order to to enable this. And then uh, by by working backwards, um, uh, you you can add all the all the different losses uh, in the, in the waveguide, including some some loss on the fiber ring, two dB over fiber ring. Probably it's a, it's around a kilometer. Uh, could be about a kilometer, a couple hundred meters range. Um, ISMF waveguide modulator, uh, driving voltage, and we can work back how much power, how much power we need, we need from um, from the laser. We can also in, in in this type of the scenario put some some specific constraints um, uh, on on the power. For instance, uh, we don't want to exceed uh, like a two two dBm power um, on the on the on the ring modulator. Uh, because when, when you start increasing power, I think is uh, becoming operate in the nonlinear region when when it's too much power is is coming. So so when when it's entering the ring, the ratio between waveguide and inside the ring is becoming high, and we have a self heating effect and the resonance is shifting. So that that may 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 cause some uh, complication, for instance, for the thermal tuning, although it shouldn't shouldn't much affect um, the speed. But if we if we if we if we run some um, uh, some 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 calculation for instance, and um, for for NRZ six, uh, 64 uh, gigabyte uh, per, per per second, 
uh, we, we, we can actually achieve this and OMA um, uh, requires OMA for this bit, bit error rate uh, at uh, like 11.5 dBm to, to enable uh, 1 in 15 uh, bit error rate. Uh, if you go to higher and higher uh, order of magnitude, um, of course, uh, of course, the uh, the you, you encode uh, more, more signals, more, more, more bit, more, 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 you have uh, several levels uh, in the transmitted bit uh, for for levels, so you transmitted two bits per, um, per 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 bit time. Uh, so uh, OMA OMA may drop, and actually this is also affected. And in the in the bit error rate for uh, for pan four, and in this calculation we also look at the two two kind of scenarios. Uh, looking at uh, PIN diode or standard diode, when you when you have actually some some kind of couple of the factors which affecting the different type of the noises. And I, I mean it's it's important to include all the all the noise sources on the, on the detector because signal signal to, to noise level is at the end the the, the key factor that uh, determine and your uh, bit error rate. So uh, depending on the type of the, the application, I mean, type of the detector you use, either it's a regular detector or avalanche detector, um, the, the noise figures can be, can be different. And um, in, 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 this, in this comparison, actually, um, we show that using, using APD, uh, for instance, detector with even, uh, even relatively small multiplication, um, uh, this is the, the, the multi um, avalanche multiplication when when the um, regular diodes have typically you know one amps per volt, and in the APD you can you can get a little bit higher uh, due to the the avalanche effect. Um, it's it's definitely this device is way way more noisy, but but having having APD uh, can actually uh, improve improve your performance um, uh, in terms of in terms of signal to noise ratio for the for the bit rate. So that's that's definitely um, that's definitely one way to go uh, in order to enable um, high speed uh, high speed transceivers. Okay, so um, maybe one one uh, final slide in in the conclusion. Um, so uh, uh, couple founders, you know, uh, and the development of this forty five technology has a kind of uh, uh, in the back of the mind primary application of the data center uh, connection and, and the transceiver. So a uh, lot of lot of devices are actually uh, developed uh, looking 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 on into this this and uh, application space. Uh, this is actually the, the primary primary use um, of, of it. But of course uh, there are some several different technology flavors and uh, depending on the different application which which uh, um, can be can be can be can be included and considered. In the monolithic application, what, what we believe it's actually it's giving a very nice key, key benefit um, uh, to, to build such a such a transceiver uh, because the, the close integration and um, electronics and the photonics can really push push your modulation speed. So uh, we, we we could go go faster. We can have a we have a lower parasitic between um, uh, CMOS devices, electronic devices, and the photonics. Uh, so this is this is another aspect removed that may may limit limit your speed, and uh, improve power consumption and and integration overall. Uh, building the logic uh, next to next to your your component is also uh, also beneficial, and of course the the host IC does not really have to drive silicon photonics. So over there in this in the monolithic integration scheme, in principle you could use any any suitable technology, um, to, to realize your 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 function. And next aspect, uh, state of the art photonics. Uh, we, we have demonstrated uh, uh, low loss silicon, silicon nitride, waveguide, and um, devices. Uh, we have a polarization speeder. Uh, pretty much every every single building block um, you need or you may think of um, uh, to 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 realize uh, some some optical routing or optical uh, functionality. And uh, what is what is also very important and. Uh, yeah, you know, it's a, it's a packaging solution. So uh, integration of the multi-wave uh, light sources by, for instance, in in, in this generation, flip shipping laser. Uh, maybe next generation we will we we'll move a step forward with some um, uh, different uh, ways of monolithic integra uh, integration of the laser. 
passive and then fiber attachment and uh, copper pillars um, to actually enable to um, putting host IC on, on top of it. Um, and uh, finally, uh, some some acknowledgement uh, for for the team, a couple of uh, people, uh, especially who who contributed to 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 this presentation, this talk, like Engewont, uh, Massimo, Sorbara, Ted, Asif, Francis, Vikas, Yushen, Krod, and pretty much entire um, GF team, which is actually scattered uh, among um, different sites, not only Malta but also Burlington, Fishkill. Mm, or, or Singapore, so um, and they, they they contribute to the development of the technology, both ITWG and uh, the one forty five SPC law. Thank you for your attention, and if you have any question, I'll be happy to to answer. Thank you, Fred, for this uh, talk, exposing us to what is possible, uh, what has been possible, and what is potentially possible. Uh, so, with your permission, Vijay, shall we go ahead with the questions? Yeah, please, please, please. Yeah. Yeah. So I have uh, already eight questions in the uh, chat window, question and answer section. First one is from Kumar Piyush. Uh, how does one overcome the challenge of integrating the curvilinear design of electronic waveguides and the design of electronics as well as develop the You're breaking a little bit. I cannot hear you. Uh, uh, if I your voice was broken uh, uh, in between. Is it better now? Yeah. Okay. The question is how does one overcome the challenge of uh, integrating the curvilinear design of photonic waveguides and the Manhattan design of electronics as well as develop the design rules, DRC rules for these co integrated designs? Uh, yeah. So Indeed, that's that's a that's a little bit technological challenge in here. Uh, you, 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 we have we have you know you can you can route waveguide draw the waveguide and in the in the tool in this in the linear manner. So and and indeed electronics are are, are Manhattanized, but they are not they are fabricated in the same line, but they are in the different steps. So uh, so uh, and they are also uh, subject of the different and uh, different uh, optical correction rules. So it, it it is it is possible to to build them both. But what is more important, um, your PDK or you know the the design enablement has to actually allow you to do that. And this is this is actually what we have um, enabled uh, in in our PDK um, and and in the design environment. So uh, we, we, for instance, take benefits of, of curvy core engine, uh, for instance, provided by, by, by Cadence. So uh, you can design the smooth, um, a smooth design um, in, in the photonics and uh, keep, keep, keep working on the electronics and, and the matter as, as, you, as you did in the past. So it, it's, it's very easy to have this uh, monolithic integration of those devices and implement it into one kind of design environment. So it's kind of uh, seamlessly designed and not only the design, but also uh, uh, in the PDK, we enabled a simulation and a co-simulation between uh, photonics and, and uh, electronics uh, working with, with, with our partners uh, to, to, to support that. related to slide 10 where you were showing monolithic CMOS and silicon photonic device. Uh, is that something that you're developing or is it something uh, already out there? Oh, it's, it's, it's already out. Uh, the, slide, the, 10. Uh, slide 10. Slide 10, I think it's been done. Yeah. So, so, so this part is actually already developed. Uh, we, we are we 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 are offering offering this this technology currently also in the in the MPWs, where you can uh, we pro we provide the library of the uh, photonics and electronic blocks. Also working on the the reference circuits and uh, driver and the TIAs that that uh, customers uh, could, could use and you can you can join mpw shuttle to to design uh, to design a transceiver or or any any and any silicon photonic um uh, chip okay uh 
I'll come back to uh, Kumar Piyush's question once again. There's one more question. But uh, Ashutosh has a question, which uh, with the Vigro fiber attachment, what are the general expected lifetime of the attachment? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, honestly, I don't know. I think um, standard standard technology reliability is is ten years, uh, the, the lifetime. So you have you have a, like a failing parts per per per, per billion or or um, uh, like that. So uh, I think I think the qualification uh, we, we pass internal qualification of this one or and and but I cannot I cannot really answer in in details uh, what is it I I don't know that. But in, in general, uh, each component, what we are qualifying is, is to ensure the lifetime uh, over 10 years, at least. Okay, a related question is, uh, you know, don't you, do you have grating couplers uh, in such uh, transceiver designs? Do you think about that? Yes, yes, we do also have a grating couplers um, in, the, in the design. Um, in, this, in this talk, I have not uh, spent too much time discussing them because and uh, had in mind more like a WGM system with a multiple wavelength. Uh, so uh, narrow band, narrow band breaking couplers, they are not really suitable for, for such a solution. And um, having having uh, edge couplers and the uh, wing roofs, it's, it's way better, way better to go for the, you know, like a commercial uh, commercial product application. Sure. But the grating couplers are also, also available there and normally used. Terabits per second per millimeter is limited by one millimeter length, or rather, why is it limited? And how can we match the modulation speed with the detector speed as they have their own speeds? Um, so, terabits per second per millimeter, I think, is just a unit to to describe how much how much data you can you can push uh, through the through the edge of the chip, whether you're using, for instance, VGroove or uh, edge coupler um, um, or, or, or grating coupler or just uh, st straight wave like so pretty much it's a um, channel channel density and um, density integration so if you squeeze uh, more wavelength more channels into one one physical channel waveguide or the of the fiber then you can push this number higher per millimeter square and if you of course you can build your chip with with bigger size to to ensure you know higher higher data um, and uh, second part for question, I think, was about the matching the speed. So um, here, um, for for the for the modulators and and, and the detectors, um, they are a little bit different different devices. Uh, one is one is germanium diode modulator is a silicon silicon diode. They have a little bit different properties. And uh, what we see that it's it's kind of a little bit easier to achieve higher bandwidth on the detector. Um, it's 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 relatively small and uh, RC constant is not not really limiting the speed. You can push push the bandwidth, you know, uh, very easily over over 50 or 60 gigahertz. In the silicon uh, silicon modulators, uh, when you're working with the carrier depletion type, especially, um, it, it's not so easy to, to to push the bandwidth. But there are some tricks you can you can work with, um, uh, like 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 the the type of the PN junction you use it. And uh, implant uh, density uh, to 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 play with RC constant uh, to to make sure that the, the device is, is faster. So our our current current objective is to uh, make sure that uh, you can comfortably work with the 56 gigabyte per second, and um, which means you know above 35 35 gigahertz bandwidth. But we also have in mind you know pushing pushing this technology faster, uh, 64 may, maybe even even faster. Um, so, so uh, that's why I'm working on the different type of the modulators to to boost the speed, uh, get get closer to 50 or exceed 50 gigahertz um, bandwidth. Okay. So, in the same slide, the next question is: Why is there a factor of two in the power penalty? Oh, it's it's actually coming coming with the um, modulation efficiency of of the of the modulator. Um, so here I get one just image showing vertical pin junction, but if you imagine here the uh, imagine here the lateral pin junction, uh, the the optical power optical mode interacting with the depletion region will be much smaller. Uh, when it's much smaller, that means the when when you apply the voltage or uh, remove the carriers from from the waveguide, wavelength resonance shift uh, will be smaller. So 
with with VPN you can get like a 50 60 picometer per volt uh, with LPN probably around 30 so on, almost like a half of it so if if you if your separation of the resonance is smaller then 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 extinction ratio will be smaller and if you if you calculate uh, a transmitter penalty at the maximum OMA, you actually end up with this with this around 2 dB and uh, reduction of the OMA between those two those two different uh, those two modulation schemes. I mean those two type of the, the junction implemented in the in the ring. And and uh, another question. I mean I have a related question in this slide. Uh, so when you uh, you talked about how to optimize our operating points such that the insertion loss is minimal. Do you uh, also see uh, this process resulting in some kind of chirp? Uh, what was the last part? Sorry. Do you see the process resulting in some kind of chirp because you are riding on the, uh, you know, the tran transfer curve of a ring resonator? So, uh, would it result in a chirp? I think, I think uh, she is asking about if there is any frequency chirping because the Wait, transfer function is not linear. Yeah. I see. I see. So, um, in, in, in the development of the device uh, is indeed um, a little bit the tricky and understanding. Uh, mm, uh, well, the, the performance of the device definitely depends um, on the operating wavelength, uh, you know, in respect to, to the resonance. And this is the, the detuning wavelength. And um, actually, this type of the graph, when you when you calculate um, transmitter penalty, for instance, uh, or, or relative OMA, um, uh, like this normalized to the input power, um, you, have, you have the curve, uh, which shows you actually the, the, the specific bandwidth uh, where where OMA is 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 actually maximized or the transmitter penalty is minimized. So if you operate at this point or or or, or this particular point from the receiver point of view, and uh, is actually exactly the same condition. At this point, you may have higher extinction ratio, lower in, and also higher insertion loss, but but the transmitter penalty or OMA is the same as on this point. When the when the at, at, at this particular point your uh, extinction ratio might drop, insertion loss also will drop. So um, uh, so so uh, question is what, what would be the suitable uh, suitable um, region of the operating? And there is another aspect to this. Maybe I have a, a tiny slide uh, on the on the bottom, uh, actually showing. And I haven't discussed the, this part in details. Tiny tiny slide, uh, tiny image at the bottom. Uh, when when you look at the speed of the modulator, actually the speed of the modulator it also depends um, on your operating operating point, and, and the value the value I discussed here they are at the maximum OMA uh, reported uh, at the maximum OMA our our target. So when you're operating at the resonance, uh, of course uh, there is not 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 much of the transmission because um, uh, you've got very high high insertion loss. And then when you, when you detune from the resonance, the, the gain of the modulator is increasing. Your OMI go, goes up. And once once a specific wavelength OMI uh, is, is maximum, and for this one, for instance, um, you, you, can, you can report this is your optimal operating point of the modulator in terms of the wavelength. So th this, this point corresponds to a maximum OMA, and you have a, you have a, a given, given bandwidth. Uh, like uh, for instance, 35 gigahertz, 45, depending on the modulator. But by by in even further detuning uh, ring resonance, uh, so pushing pushing the wavelength more more to the further away from the resonance, and um, you you compromising um, um, OMA, uh, but you you can actually increase the bandwidth. So that could be could be actually additional trick to to work to work with this device. Uh, so uh, if you if you detune uh, further away from the resonance, you can boost boost a little bit the speed, uh, compromising compromising your extension ratio. So again, depending depending on the depending on the application, uh, receiver sensitivity for the same uh, OMA uh, receiver sens sensitivity is proportional to the OMA. So um, at this point or or this point, you have uh, actually the same the same value of OMA. Um, as the as the um, transmitter transmitter curve shows, and uh, the the one closer to the resonance will be probably a little bit slower than you than you detune from the resonance. 
But if you go further away from the resonance, extension ratio goes a little bit down. So it might not be so such a, for instance, suitable to, to go for the higher order of, of, of modulation. So yeah, op operating point is also a little bit the uh, uh, trade off between, between the performance. And with the modulator, you can also play with the um, quality factor. Uh, if you have a more shallow, shallow device, then, then uh, typically extension ratio will go down and device may, may become faster. The photon cavity lifetime will be um, definitely defined, uh, push, push the bandwidth of the modulator. And also, and also um, the wavelength range will be becoming a, a little bit bigger. Uh, when, when the transmitter penalty is, is very low. Maybe at this time I'll follow up on that. But um, the next question is again from Kumar, very interesting. Uh, in a monolithic integration, how would you avoid the crosstalk due to the heat generated by the electronic circuit, which could potentially affect the photonic uh, device performance? That's a that's an excellent question, and uh, you have to take this into account while you're designing your circuitry, and uh, you want to benefit from you know close integration electronics and the photonics, so you want to put them as close as possible together. But of course, there is a crosstalk. So um, uh, in the design phase or the thermal tuning, for instance, of the ring devices, this is actually one one of the best example when you have a driver and the ring. Uh, Put close to together, so you have to take in account that the electronics will generate the heat, and uh, you have actually two options: either you push it, push them a little bit further away, and to 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 lower the thermal crosstalk, or you actually use the thermal crosstalk, um, in 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 your benefit. So uh, the driver, operating driver, uh, will will generate the heat and will kind of preheat preheat your your modulator. So um, uh, it, it's required indeed to have a, a thermal thermal feedback loop uh, that that this this takes takes into account this external heat generating coming from the driver because depending on the data rate uh, and the speed of the modulation of the driver and uh, the different different power will be generated on the electronic driver so will be different temperature on the on the modulator. Uh, you can try to isolate them, for instance, using UCAT module uh, to, to help isolate the heat, but you can also uh, work with them and uh, yeah, there is, there is pretty uh, no way to do that. Uh, in the, in the, even, in, in, even in the hybrid integration, when, when you put an electronic chip on top of the, on top of the driver uh, the, and you do the flip chip face down, and the, the, the heat will, will also spread and will affect the, the modulator. So this is this is part of the thermal control circuit that had to be taken care of. Sure. Uh, why is there a double ring used in the MUX and DMUX? So uh, for 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 DMUX, um, uh, you can actually use use also one ring, single order of of the coupled ring resonator. You could use even triple order. So depending on the on the number of the rings, you can actually achieve a flat flat response. And the more rings you you stack, the the, the wider flat response you can you can get. Mm, so um, this is kind of architecture or the design choice. And and if you have a flat response uh, and then some kind of fixed laser grid, right? Uh, you can, as, as I mentioned, you can allow uh, collective thermal tuning. If you have a single ring. And the, the response is relatively well. It's a response is like a like a drop port of the of the uh, ring modulator, so it's very very sharp, very steep. So every single channel has to be tuned in that case individually. So that's a kind of design architecture choice. You can go either way. It also okay. depends. It might, might also depend on the number of channels you want to um, uh, you want to put. Uh, and an uh, amount of the heat uh, you you can you can dissipate. Yeah. Um, it's another question on the importance of forward error correction. Uh, as the technology expands to pack more bits, how must how far must be uh, must FEC be improved, and how is DSP computation catching up with that? DSP is catching up, but. The, I think the question is, uh, how does uh, one implement FEC uh, 
in this transceiver and I suppose it's, it's through the ASICs that you would co-integrate. Uh, so, I'm not sure if I'm getting right the, the question. So, when you build the transceiver, put on the package, actually like a even a package with, with, with the optics, with the host, uh, is the, the power power dissipation or handling heat, um, uh, heat with, with the PCB and, right, that, that, that's the question? No, how do you do forward error correction here? Because you showed better rates of Oh, forward error detection. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So, sorry, I, I didn't get it uh, at, at the beginning. Um, so, in the in so specifically, the... I mean, just to you know clarify specifically, the question says uh, ADCs and uh, DAC. <coughs> how do you now do it at the chip level? So, uh, yeah. So, um, uh, forward error correction, and you can you can actually uh, implement. Uh, you know, after after uh, after the receiver circuit, you you get some error. You can put some error correction, and again, uh, having having possibility in the monolithic flow, you can put put some circuitry directly directly next to next to the TIA. And um, in the in the hybrid approach, uh, of course, everything is taken by by the host IC. Which is flip chip on top of it, and and they, they can deal um, uh, with, with those data. So uh, that's why that's why um, uh, in, in in this scenario when, when we when we start looking, we we actually want to um, enable very low error rate, like a level one in minus fifteen. Uh, so you actually don't need any error correction. Um, so uh, so this this has to ensure the very high signal to noise ratio. And uh, of course, this this is for the uh, low power, short reach, and low latency link. So no no error correction, high and um, uh, very low bit bit error rate. But of course, if you start um, if you start increasing, for in, that was actually one of, of very very good example. If you if you keep keep uh, pretty much the same power, um, uh, error error rate from one e fifteen can can drop to one e three. Uh, depending whether you use NLZ or or PAM for PAM for modulation, so um, yeah, question there. Uh, if you need error correction, well, you have to you have to implement a specific uh, specific circuitry um, uh, to to handle that, and this will this will add to your to your power budget, uh, total power budget circuit. Not only add to your latency, but circuit will of course consume an um, additional power. Uh, to do the to the error correct, correction, so the so it's it's coming question whether whether it's worth to to spend uh, spend this power let's say on the um, uh, on the error correction or maybe it's better to uh, spend a little bit more power for instance to increase I don't know maybe driver voltage so you have a better extinction ratio better OMA or maybe you can better spend this power on the on the laser. So increase, increase, increase the increase the laser power. So you get you get a better signal to noise ratio. Uh, it's a little bit again a kind of uh, application architecture kind of uh, approach. Uh, which way which way to go? Sure. Is the monolithic optoelectronic platform open for MPWs? Could customers from EU research institutions access this technology in future through Euro practice? Um, that's a that's a good, good question. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, we are offering MPW, and it's pretty much enabled for anybody. I, I'm not sure if uh, Europe Practice is currently partner of it. I would have to I have to uh, check it, or um, probably you can you can also find out this information in in, in Global Foundry's website uh, regarding you know collaboration and, and MPWs. Uh, how to actually uh, jump in on the MPW right? So it is. I think it is available already in the Euro practice and also uh, from the website. But it looks like that they are not open to everyone. I think uh, the selected customers so they are choosing actually. Well, uh, thanks, thanks, thanks for that. I, I'm, I'm not more on this on this uh, business side, uh, and so it was difficult to to comment on that. Uh, we, we, I know that we have a very high interest uh, of, uh, yeah. you know, from, from different customers, and uh, the reason probably for that is that, you know, not, um, yeah, we cannot accommodate everybody. 
or we will have to probably increase uh, increase frequency of MPWs to, to make sure you know everybody can get uh, a piece of silicon as well. But that that's maybe maybe more more question to the to the business side of of uh, global founders. So, yeah, there's one last question here: How many different wavelengths can be integrated? Uh, laser. Oh, so this is like a uh, this is depend on the on the laser. So uh, you can do the follow the different schemes, uh, and here we rely on the um, laser laser supplier. So we, which provide the, the laser. You can get, for instance, top laser, which generates you know fixed fixed grid of the of the laser, and then you use this one as a building block flip chip uh, on on top of the. Um, uh, flip chip on the silicon, silicon uh, and 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 use the this comp laser. Um, you you could also use external laser source. Uh, put somewhere else. I, I think uh, in general uh, in the forty five we don't want to limit uh, what's the source of the light. You could use VGroove to provide the light source to the chip or or integrate. So it's again a architecture kind of problem. But uh, we definitely want to enable uh, process technology and validate this process that you can actually flip chip and integrate the um, light source on, on the chip. I have a question. I mean, if you still have time. <laughs> sure. Yeah. You said at some point that the passive components have a 100 gigahertz limit. Where is that limit well, coming from for the passive components? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if I. I, I remember that on the on the slides, I think supports beyond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, the, yeah, I mean the, the the main message here or the it was that actually, um, the the speed of of uh, transceiver it is not really related to the uh, to the passive because, uh, light light frequency is terahertz and we when we putting you know envelope of a uh, gigabytes on off or or the different modulation it does not really uh, should should affect um the the performance of the photonic and uh, passive passive devices and what what i actually want to make make here a point that um passive devices may may affect uh, how fast we can go in terms of the losses what they contributing to the total link um in, in that matter, uh, in that matter, a reduction of the loss may, means better signal to noise ratio, which means better uh, bit error rate. So what you can achieve, you can you can improve your um, uh, transceiver performance, for instance, by reducing, allowing to reduce a little bit laser power for the same uh, signal to noise ratio. And any comments on uh, realizing IQ modulators? Uh, yes, those modulators um, uh, based based on, for instance, Max Zender and uh, uh, lattice uh, splitting, phase shifting. We we do actually have some working on internally as well as some kind of reference circuits to, to build 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 those modulators. They are uh, uh, as as you know they may be a little bit more uh, bigger, more more bulky uh, than. And uh, also a lot of our partners, also via via uh, via MPWs, actually, and looking at these these devices because uh, coherent or or, or IQ type of modulations actually are very interest. And and uh, yeah, in, in this in this in this talk, I, I try to actually a little bit focus about about the ring and you know trying to minimize the power uh, for for the short reach. But depending on the application, you you indeed. We are free to use different type of modulation scheme, and and um, IQ is one of them. Definitely. Yeah, my point was, you know, how successful is IQ modulator on silicon uh, photonics? Uh... Oh, uh, then then probably I would probably better um, to 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 refer some some publications on that. I think they should come uh, quite soon. Uh, I know. Uh, I think I think some 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 our. Uh, partners, we are also MPW. They were actually wo working on that. Um, okay. in, in in general, what we're trying in, in terms of the technology development, we, we're trying to build the building blocks required to build a component. And indeed, IQ is, is combination of uh, it's like a higher level uh, hierarchy um, device. 
uh, right so um, it's, it's difficult also for, for internal development to to go through all uh, possibilities you know of, of the components uh, um, uh, you can you can imagine for a bit from the building blocks So the part, so I think uh, Sudar Sonan is the in the panel. I think if he has any comments or questions, sir. Sudar uh, No, the, that was a very great talk. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I'm quite impressed with uh, the suite of elements that's available through Global Foundries. Uh, You've done, I mean, uh, uh, speaking as a person in silicon photonics, uh, it's hard to explain to people how much work this is, right? Uh, so, uh, at least those who appreciate silicon photonics and have been in this field know how difficult it is. Uh, so, yeah, I, I can only uh, sort of uh, shake your hand in hand and say, okay, this, this is a great job that you've done. Uh, it's great to see that Gamer Foundries is also uh, uh, interacting and is keen in implementing silicon photonics. And you see the advantage that many don't, right? So, uh, yeah, I, yeah, we all hope for the success of each of us uh, wherever we want to implement. So, is uh, is Global Foundries actually trying to make any product uh, per se? Global Foundry is a fab. Uh, so, right. so are you in like, is to deliver with, with someone who, like, are you planning to have some kind of an IP block for this we do. that can be commercialized? Absolutely. Actually, actually, we do because it depends on the on the complexity. Uh, we're working on some uh, IP blocks. Well, you can actually f uh, consider WDM filter um, as a as an IP block uh, because because it's composed of the the smaller components. So sing, sing, single component like this is a couple couple of ring resonator. But if you if you stack it, you you become you you're becoming kind of like a circuit. It's an optical circuit. And it has a kind of uh, a lot of to it, uh, like for instance, distance type of the connection. In this case, is kind of drawn straight line, but you can imagine some some different dif different type of connection. So this could be this could be also considered um, uh, indeed as a as an IP because it's a, like a higher level hierarchy on the on the building block. Right, but and how, it's, how it's do you see? Way... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, in, in sim I think in similar way, we we trying to build some um, IPs or at least reference circuit in the electronics. Um, right. Refer reference circuit, for instance, for the uh, ring thermals uh, stabilization, um, driver, uh, TIA. Uh, so uh, ideally, uh, indeed, uh, would be would be nice to offer kind of a package. You know, you have your modulator together together with the driver. That they are actually co-designed and and optimized, so it's just you know plug and play from from the from the library and and use in the in the product. Okay, and perhaps one last follow up to that, just because you talked about making these filters into blocks, um, you you are aware of the work that uh, people are trying to do these so-called programmable circuits, right? Um, in fact, CPPEX itself is involved in making one such circuit and trying to commercialize it. Um, do, do you think there is a place for both to coexist, like these kind of specialized dual ring filters, WDM, uh, as opposed to something that's more generic, that can be sort of manipulated to get the filter function you want? Uh, there's, I mean, pros and cons for each. Uh, but yeah, do you, do you see uh, one way or the other that's beneficial? Um, I don't know how, how successful it would be if you just had an IP block on this double ring filter. Say you also had it with, uh, I think your argument goes where you're giving it as a package, right? So it's not just the two ring filters 
but I'm also giving you the corresponding electronics that goes to controlling and tuning this ring resonators and tuning it to wherever you, it needs to be. That's the signal acquisition. So it's sort of like a, a combined IP block, right? Yeah, like an electronic photonic IP block, uh, which is quite interesting actually in itself. I, I don't know if anyone is sort of working towards an electronic photonic OIP block, right? Uh, it's yeah. quite, quite, so, yeah. so so Global Foundry's primary is a foundry. We are not really a design house. Uh, we, we can work on some, some internally, some IP blocks or, you know, verification proof of concept. And uh, what we could do, we could also partner with, you know, uh, external, you know, designers to enable to co-design in the technology and enable uh, in, in our PDK. Uh, such such a circuitry, I think that was uh, also done um, for 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 instance for the CMOS part, uh, logic library or some uh, standard standard electronics blocks, uh, you know third party uh, provide provide the IP that could be could be reused. With the photonics, as you know, it's it's kind of you know still emerging technology and and uh, the. It's difficult to 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 define a really a kind of also IP blocks for for this this type of the circuitry. And maybe I can give some some example. Uh, actually, once we're talking about the WDM filters, for instance, and um, physical physical spacing between each of the channel is is important. Uh, for instance, for the crosstalk, but uh, you you may you may not kind of uh, it's difficult to kind of fix it uh, or lock it uh, like a channel spacing. Because, because depending on the kind of application or how how actually the final product is made, you may want to have a specific channel channel placement on the chip in order to matching your your electronic circuits or uh, matching your um, host host IC uh, in integrated. So uh, it's it's a, it's a lot of flexibility flexibility in in, in here um, that that uh, from the foundry when when we when we offering uh, like a Pixel, Pixel, or the or the IP, uh, we could put some constraints to satisfy, you know, let's say one, one customer on one particular application. But then it's coming another one, and we would like to, you know, reshuffle it again. So this is this is uh, still a little bit evolving. Uh, uh, we want to, at the first step, um, ensure that we enabled all the building blocks required for you to build um, uh, to build your circuit. Uh, so, uh, so uh, at first place, uh, want to enable uh, just a coupled ring resonator, and then how you stack them, how you put the channels, how many channels you put them, what will be the physical distance? It's a little bit, a little bit up to up to kind of designer or the product you know you, you're working on. It. Uh, we can we can give some guidance in terms of you know thermal crosstalk, how close you to put. Uh, from 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 um, uh, from our our you know technology development experience, uh, but but you know uh, fi fi final design is up to um, uh, you know up to the the, the actually design house what what what's, what is building. Um, in in terms of the kind of the programmable uh, pro programmable circuitry, it's actually a monolithic platform can can bring some some extra benefits because uh, you can you can closely integrate uh, electronics next to it, so it's actually possible to to bouncing between optical and then electrical uh, signals um, to 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 controlling them to make the programmable some some. Uh, Electro optical uh, logic, electro optical neural networks, uh, because because you can very tightly integrate it, and you you do not depend on the you know third party uh, circuitry, which actually making either process more expensive and complicated when you still have to uh, flip chip or, or provide some um, electronic circuitry uh, to 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 the chip from from the external. So you can integrate everything into into one process. So you can go way, way beyond simple, simple transceiver, um, and and uh, build completely new, new functionality. So uh, from for foundry goal point of view is to trying to see what could be useful and, and uh, for, for for the future and and keep developing those devices, qualifying them, because as a, as a foundry, uh, I, uh, you know that. And uh, we have to ensure um, proper reliability of the devices. 
So it's not only uh, like I remember from from you know university time, you know, happy when you when you fabricated or demonstrated one the device, uh, working, uh, meeting the spec. In here we have to ensure um, uh, yeah, reliability, yeah. right? Reliability over you know uh, li uh, ten years lifetime uh, for the for the photonic devices, and um, also uh, repeatability. So every every single device is uh, fabricated or within you know. Some, some some margin wafer to wafer so repeatability everything is has to be also uh, verified and, and checked uh, so it's indeed way way more complex process to to enable for the commercial use okay. thank you michael thank you very much uh... Deepa, yeah just a quick couple of questions i don't want to take much time i think it, it is very informative uh, informative talk i think our students and all the audience got a lot of information and uh, well presented, Michael. Thank you very much for that. Uh, just one quick question. Uh, you, you, you said that uh, uh, the electronics and photonics, you do uh, two different type of device layer, electronic 88 nanometer and photonics 160 nanometer. So, what is, your, so what is your starting device layer thickness? So uh, initial silicon thickness uh in, in in our platform is 160 nanometers i think that was okay. one of the first slide uh so of course uh, you may have different silicon thickness the other i think popular number is 220 right uh, 220 yeah. nanometers as, a, as an initial silicon thickness okay. and of course um, it, it affects a little bit the the, the performance but in, in here, we, we we made choice to go with the silicon thickness uh, in order actually to enable um, uh, CMOS devices. And uh, keep keep in mind that it has a lot of lot of kind of consequences. Uh, different silicon thickness. You have to thin 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 silicon uh, for the photonic devices uh, to make the uh, SOI SOI fats. And uh, also thicker silicon will will uh, limit your uh, area in the middle of the line. So uh, you would like to also put silicon nitride here in the middle line be before you start your first metallization. So ideally, you know, and also depends how you put your uh, silicon nitride, whether it's uh, closer to the waveguide, whether, whether it's uh, on top of the germanium module. This distance between 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 like a contact of the transistor to your first metal might be might be actually quite high. So that there is kind of compromise in the performance. Uh, you don't want to make these contacts too high because then, then you will actually compromise uh, performance of the electronics. So uh, se selection of the 60, 160 nanometer SOI uh, it was, was kind of you know, a compromise between the performance of the photonics and, and okay. electronics. So, uh, so just one more technical question also that, so you, you said that your waveguide loss, you are selling like that, it is less than point, uh, less than one dB, 0.4 dB per centimeter. I think that is you are giving, uh, that's a silicon nitrate waveguide loss. Probably silicon waveguide loss, maybe still it is in the order of one dB per centimeter, right? That's correct, that's correct. And uh, the last question probably. So you were, you are offering in 45 s PCLO uh, that polarization rotator. Uh, so is that the polarization rotator you are offering with silicon nitride waveguide or silicon waveguide itself? It's actually silicon silicon nitride. So it's a, it's a combination on on uh, using silicon nitride and the silicon. I think the, there was one of the sketch kind of animation here showing that the uh, orange uh, or red color is showing silicon and on top of it is a silicon nitride so we, we actually using both layers to to create a, a polarization a splitter and rotator mm, okay okay yeah, yeah. okay and but at, I... at the end at the end you you may end up with you know uh, we have also couplers between one of the other so the the idea either Either you enter with the silicon nitride, for instance, you go through the polarization rotator, and then you end up at the output with the silicon or silicon nitride. It's 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 up to you. You can route um in in whatever layers you actually want to. Okay. So uh, yeah, I am done. I don't want to. I think already you are almost touching two hours. I think Deepa, you just. <laughs> You can just conclude probably. I think I don't want to take much time. Early morning, you woke up. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, starting very early for our sake. And very illuminated. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you again for the invitation. It was a pleasure to, to, to speak to you. I hope I brought something new to the table. Yes, yeah, or, or at least put put some 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 vision uh, on the photonics and um, coming coming from the from the foundry. Yeah. Looking so, forward for future interactions and thanks to all the participants for uh, you know, posing also nice questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mikal, and also uh, I don't know Sujit has not uh, joined today. Just convey our regards because of him only we got you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much once again. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. You too. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.